So everybody should be turning to Romans chapter 8. Hopefully you have your Bible with you, whether it be paper form or whether it be electronically. I want to encourage you to always open the Word. Uh, the Bible says it's a sword, and it's a sword of the Spirit, but it's a sword. And where does a sword belong? It belongs in the hand, right? So I want to encourage you to get the sword. The sword should be in the hand. We ought to use it. Now we do have... Uh, the verses that we'll put up on the screen for maybe those that didn't bring your Bible with you or whatever, but always want to encourage you to bring your Bible. I think that's really, really super important because that's what we center everything we do around is the Word of God. And so we want to make sure uh, that you have your Bible with you. Well, you know, <clears throat> we have... Uh, have you ever, as a kid, been intrigued with the rainbow? Anybody ever been intrigued with a rainbow? Isn't it absolutely beautiful to see a rainbow in the sky? How many of you have ever seen a double rainbow before? You've been as fortunate to see a double rainbow, okay? So a lot of you have. There might be a few of you that haven't. That is absolutely amazing. But you know, in kids' books, we often read about rainbows. And in the rain, with the rainbow, especially if there's leprechauns involved, what's, what is it It's at the end of the rainbow? A pot of gold, yeah! How many of you have ever gone looking for that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? Come on, be honest. Be honest. I know there's not. All right, there's only three of us that are honest. The rest of you got to repent before the day's out. All right? You just don't want to admit it. But all of us have wanted to try to find that pot at the end of the rainbow. And so, you know, when I was a kid, I might walk across the field trying to get to the end of the rainbow only to find out that I just couldn't, I didn't. I couldn't get there and so as a teenager once I got my license I realized that I had a little more of an opportunity to actually get to the end of the rainbow so with a car I'd drive and it's like man it moved or something what's the deal I thought I was going in the right direction and finally you get to where you thought it was only to find out it's not right here it's like way over there okay I might be the only one Betty and I, we've been uh, able to go to the beach. And one day, when at the beach, we went up to the beach and, and the waves were coming in. And Betty just, she wanted to get in the water really bad. That was kind of going to be a beach day. And she wanted to go out and get in the water. And so we got there. And the water was just a light tan brown as it rolled in. Now, what that meant was that it was churning up a whole lot of sand. And the sand was rolling in with the so you know what that means, right? When a lot of sand's coming in with the water? You know what that means. That means you're going to get out with more sand on you and in you in places it doesn't belong when you get out to leave, right? And that's what she's looking at. She gets her feet out in the water. She's like, this is not good. I don't want to do this, you know? Um, because your bathing suit just fills up with sand, right? You walk out about 15 pounds heavier than when you went in. And so she's standing there, and next thing you know, you look down the coast there, and it's like down the way, there's other people swimming. Nobody's swimming here. There's people swimming down there, and, it, and you see the light tan brown go like this, and all of a sudden it curves in, and the water is blue, bluish green going down, and then it goes right in against the shore, and that's where people are swimming. It's like, we just picked the wrong spots. Let's get in the car. We'll drive down there, and we'll swim with everybody else. So we get in the car, and we drive down the other end. We stop. We get out. We get our things together, get out to the beach, and get to the water. And it's like, the water is brown here, too. And we look down, and way down there, about the same distance as it was when we were down there, the water comes in, and it's bluish green down that way, but not. And it's like, what is the deal? No matter where we tried to go, we couldn't find that clear spot. Have you ever had those moments in life where you were looking for something and you thought you saw where it was, you thought you knew what it was, but when you went after it, it was like a mirage or an illusion. It wasn't really there. You ever had that happen before? Okay. Now, it might be on the beach. It might be with a rainbow. Uh, if we, and metaphorically speaking, it might have been that you thought you were going to find happiness at the end of the rainbow of a relationship that you started with somebody and you had the illusion that that relationship was going to be a pot of gold at the end of it only to find out it wasn't there. 
Or it might have been that job that you wanted so badly and you, got, you worked really hard and then you had this conception, this conception in your mind that you get this job, you get this certain position and man, life's going to be great and you get that job, you get that position only to find out it wasn't what you thought. It might be a house. You might have decided there's a certain house I want. Man, you get this house and you think, man, once I get this house... You know, everything that I've always wanted is going to be found in this house. And you get the house only to find out there's a lot of other things about the house you weren't expecting to get. And it wasn't the pot at the end of the rainbow. I think all of us find ourselves in that position. And I truly believe that we oftentimes and many times through our lifetime and many times through our week are looking for pots of gold at the end of a rainbow thinking if just this would happen, or if just that would happen, then everything would go my way. There are even those who go and they buy lottery tickets, thinking if they just hit the lottery, somehow that's going to fix all their problems. And yet, if you talk to people who've hit the lottery, it's only intensified their issues and their problems because they had a spending problem before they got the money, and now they've got themselves in deeper debt because they had more money they thought they could rely on and they spent more than they should have and now they're in deeper debt than they were in before they ever started. And nothing to take care of it. Oftentimes we can search for a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow that doesn't exist. Thinking that's where we'll find our satisfaction in life. I want to talk to you just for a few moments this morning about purpose and peace. You know, there's two things in life that I believe that all of us would like to have in life. One is purpose, and all of us want to have peace, don't we? We just, we just want to live in peace. We just want the world to be in peace. We just want there to be peace in our home. We just want to have a job where there's peace. We just want peace, and we want our life to have a purpose. Now, the place I get the title for my message this morning is going to be found in Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to have you look at it with me, if you would, in verse number Six And the very last part of verse number 6 says, To set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Now I changed the word life to purpose for this reason. I think we can have this misconception in our mind that to set our mind, as it says there uh, in verse number 6, to set our mind on the Spirit, we may come to this concept, setting my mind on the Spirit means... Well, I have life, so I'm breathing and, and living, and, and I'm a living creature, so I have life because of that. Well, that is true. Without the Spirit of God, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have life. Matter of fact, it's through Jesus, or it was when God breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, we became a living soul. So without God, we wouldn't have life. That is a true statement, but it goes deeper than that. It's more than just having an existence. It's having a purpose, and that's what it's talking about there. If we set our mind on the Spirit, then we will have a purpose in life. Life will be lived with a purpose. There will be a sense of element to our life. It's more than just an existence. It's a purpose. And not only purpose will we find when we set our mind on things of Spirit, but also we'll find Peace. Now, we're going to dig into that just a little bit this morning. And to do so, I'm just going to go down through here and read verse number 1 down to verse number 6. So if you will follow along with me in verse number 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that, right, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, here's the two verses I'm homing in on, verse 5 and verse 6. So look with them with me, if you would, at these verses. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set your mind on the, on the flesh is death. 
but to set your mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Here's what I want you to understand. And this is just going to be, this is just going to be a small, hopefully a very potent, very small piece that I'm going to hand you today that I want you to chew on and think about all week long. If this gets a hold of your life, I believe it will truly change your life. If you allow it to, you absorb it, you take it, and you apply it, and you set your thoughts on these things, I'm telling you, you will begin to understand purpose and, and peace in your life. And I know that's what you want, because that's what all of us want. We all want that. In the turmoil of our life, we want these two things, purpose and peace. And it says here in these verses, look again, if you would, on verse number 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds, set their what? Set their minds, one more time, they set their what? Their minds on the things of the flesh. So what is that talking about? All right, I'm going to layer this. I'm going to, I'm going to peel it back like an onion for a minute, if I may. There is an outer layer, and the outer layer is this. If you live in a flesh, how many of you are in here, you live in the flesh? Let me see your hands. Some of you are hesitant to raise your hand. Okay, you can put your hand down, you bunch of sinners. No, look, <laughs> layer one, we all live in the flesh. If you don't think you live in the flesh, reach out, pinch yourself really hard, and you'll realize you live in the flesh. Now, if you reach out and there's no flesh to grab, then you're a ghost, and I'm out of here, all right? I'm just saying. We're all in the flesh, and we live in the flesh. And the King James says that, that there is the law of the flesh, or the law of sin, and the law of sin, as the King James puts it, just simply means that there is a law of nature. That's what it's talking about, a law of nature. One of the laws of nature is, when I'm really super hungry, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to hit somebody. No, I'm not going to hit anybody. What am I going to do? Huh? I'm going to grub. Okay, that's, yeah, I'm going to grub. I'm going to eat. Right? I'm going to eat because that's the law of nature. The law of nature is when I get hungry, I'm going to eat. When you get hungry, you're going to eat. When you hurt, you cry. Right? It's a law of nature. There's things about the law of nature that makes us who we are, and we deal with that, and we have to live with that. And therefore, just like today, July the 9th, it was exactly one year ago today that my father breathed his last breath. I stood alongside of his bed the last two weeks of his life, they were the most horrific experience I had to go through, but the most blessed experience to watch a man with such grace pass from death into life, from this earthly existence into the portals of heaven. It was a beautiful thing, but it was excruciating, excruciatingly painful for me to watch it happen. I relive those moments. They're almost like nightmares to me at times. Because I stood alongside of my father's bed taking those swaths which are made out of styrofoam, or not styrofoam, but foam. And you dab them in water and you lay it against their lips and just try to wet and moisten his lips because his mouth was always dry cotton-like in his mouth all the time. I would try to clean some of it out and wipe his mouth and it'd get really dry under his lips. And, and some of those things are made like, they're like little stars. They're like, I can't tell you what, they're like a, like a, a gear. That's how they're cut with little blades all the way around them. And they're not sharp blades, they're just this foam. And you stick that in their mouth and you might twirl it as you do it across the lips trying to get that stuff out as well as and the worst part about it was there came a time where I realized my dad couldn't talk to me other than he'd moan at me or he'd try to let me know his mouth was dry and I'd moisten that and go in his mouth only to find at one point it totally, that thing had totally taken layers of skin off the inside of his lip. And now he was in pain from that. And, I, and to watch all that was so hard. It was hard. And to feel like I took responsibility that I did that. And trying to help my dad. It's hard. 
hey, we live in a flesh. The law of nature hurts deep. The cuts hurt from emotional pains and struggles. Those things are hard. But I want you to know this morning, no matter what we have to deal with in this life, no matter the hurts and the pains, no matter the struggles we see, no matter the times when we see somebody we love so much going through so much agony and there's not anything we can do to help it get any better, it's hard, it's heavy, it hurts. That's the law of nature. We deal with that every day. The loss of a job, the loss of a relationship, the loss of a loved one. I don't know what it might be that you've dealt with, but as Luke stated earlier, every one of us come in here today with needs. And that's why we're here, because only God can satisfy those needs that we have. And we're not going to find that peace and you know, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I agonized with the Lord. God, raise my dad up out of this bed, and God, give him strength and life again, and let him be able to come back and, and be a part, and yet it never happened. It was very hurtful and very painful, not hurtful, not in hurtful sense that God hurt me. It just was humanly hurtful to watch all that happen. But you know the hope in all that? <laughs> Was that my father found purpose in Jesus. He found peace in Jesus in the pain, even in the pain and the hurt. I remember in the last few weeks of his ability, to, in the last few days of his ability to, to talk and to, to express himself. I remember one day he got on this coughing spree and he couldn't quit. And man, I mean, when he'd get to coughing, it's not like he was just going to turn inside out. And he would go and go and go. And I mean, it would, you could tell his body was hurting from just the agonizing. You know what that's like, Marianne. You've had, that, you've had a cough, but he was laying on his deathbed and he'd get that going and he couldn't stop. But I remember a nurse came in there and she was just a young nurse and she was trying to help him. And, and, and he was coughing and tears coming out of his eyes. It was just, he was just through, going through so much. But finally, he caught his breath. And he looked at that young nurse and he simply said to her, he said, I don't know why God has me here, but he said, he's my peace and he's my hope. And he said, young lady, if you don't know Jesus, Jesus wants a relationship with you. If I had a camera that I could have taken and videoed that, that was so precious. Betty and I were the only two in the room. And in between all of that crazy hacking and coughing and carrying on, he took time to share Jesus, his hope and his peace. How powerful that is. I want you to know today that we live under this law of the flesh. We can't, there's not anything we can do about it. There's a law of sin. It's our flesh. We deal with pains, hurts, hungers. We deal with uh, disappointments. We deal with all these kind of things. There's times, though, that often we can feel so discouraged as a believer when we have those times of anger, when we have those times of, of bitterness that swell up inside of us, when the law of sin raises its ugly head, when we have those times where we feel like we're not trusting God like we should. And as I was there at the bedside of my father, there were times where I would just like beat up on myself thinking I'm not trusting God enough in what he's doing here. I've got to trust God because if I didn't, if I, if, if I trusted God, I wouldn't be so hurt and so sad and crying only to realize it's not that you're lacking a trust in God when the law of sin, the natural things happen. Just because I was crying didn't mean I didn't trust God. Just because I became frustrated at times didn't mean that I didn't trust God. 
I want you to know today that Satan will try to tell you in your moments of weakness, in your moments when the law of the flesh kind of swells up in itself, that somehow you feel like that's why God doesn't want to have anything to do with me. But I want to tell you something. That's a lie from Satan, and it's not true. God wants to have something to do with you. When that law of, of the flesh, all right, there's peel back the onion. The first law of the flesh is when we're hungry, we eat. When we're sleepy, we sleep, right? All these, when we're naked, we put on clothes, right? That's the law of the uh, law of nature, the law of sin. That's just there's a there's a given. That that's what happens. That's what we do. That's part of life. If I trip, I catch myself. Why? You, y'all fall? Really? No, I'm kidding. If I trip, I fall, right? It's a law of sin. It's a law of nature. It's the way it happens. What goes up must come down, right? It's a law of nature. That's first layer. Second layer of the law of nature is when we find ourselves in a place, and again, where we can become very angry, very bitter, very malicious, very spiteful. And that is the law of sin as well. When somebody does us wrong, the law of sin wants to strike back, right? It's the law of sin, the law of the flesh. Now that's the second layer and that layer is called living in the flesh in a sense of not allowing the Spirit of God to control those things. So when I find the law of sin raising up inside of me where I'm getting angry, you know what my response to that needs to be? If I confess my sins, He is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. When I have bitterness trying to raise its ugly head up, I need to confess it to God. I need to make it right with Him. I need to lay it before Him. That's that second layer, that onion that needs to be dealt with. The first part, there's not a whole lot you can do but deal with it. You're going to cry when you're sad. You might even laugh at something that maybe you're embarrassed you laughed at at times. That's just the law of the flesh. There's things that happen at times, and that's part of what happens. But when it turns into our finding ourselves, allowing things that shouldn't be in our mind. You say, Pastor, what do I do when I get angry and I get mad and I become bitter and I become spiteful? What do I do? All I can tell you is this. You can't do anything about the birds that fly over your head. But you can do something about them building a nest in your hair, if you have hair. You can avoid them from building a nest on your head, but you can't keep them from flying over your head. I can't help it when sometimes moments of anger strike over me, but I can keep them from seizing in my mind and in my heart. I can't help it when I find a moment of tinge where I get bitter about something or something happens, but I, I can prevent it from finding roots and growing inside of me. I can prevent that from happening. See, there's a law of sin that takes place in our life. And the scripture says here in verse number 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on things of the Spirit. Well, what does the Bible say about a, a man who gets married? The Bible says a man who's not married can set his, things, uh, set his mind on things of the Lord to please the Lord. But if he gets married, he sets his mind on the things of the what? Of the world to please his wife. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean he becomes worldly? No. It means that there is a law of nature that's got to be dealt with and she needs that sense of security and so there's things as a man we've got to work at making sure that we provide that security for her. Like number one, food in the cabinets is a nice little piece of security, right? So men, got to go out. The Bible says a man will eat by the sweat of his brow. That means when you get out, get a job. If you don't have a job and you're married, go get a job. Quit sitting around. It's your responsibility as a man to take care of your woman. Part of it. 
It's a law of nature as a married person. But that doesn't mean that I set my mind on the things of the world and the pleasures of the world and the, and the lust of the world and the things that the world satisfies in order to try to please my wife. There is a layer, just like an onion. There's a certain layer of that that I've got to look at. Food and a house and things that help provide for opportunity for my wife to please my wife. I need to do that as a husband. But yet, that's not where it's all at. I can't ignore that, but that's not what it's all about. You know what it's all about? It's setting my mind on the things of Spirit. Because in setting my mind on the things of Spirit, it's the things of the Spirit that is truly, hear me out, it's the pot at the end of the rainbow. Because it's my mind set on the things of the Spirit that give me hope and purpose in life when all the life's going against me. It's my relationship with Jesus that avoids the bitterness and the hurt and the malice and the anger from seizing inside of me and causing me to become hard-hearted and mean and cruel to other people. It's my relationship with Jesus. That's the pot at the end of the rainbow. So for those who live according to the flesh... Set their mind on the things of flesh. Was long, layer one, as long as you live in this flesh, you're going to have to mind the things of the flesh to some degree. Now, I think it's in, I don't know, somewhere, I can't remember, Europe or somewhere, I can't remember where it was. I think it was in Europe, I don't recall. But there is a little saying that is said that's on signs throughout, the, throughout Europe. And here's, here's what it says. Listen to me. Everybody follow with me. It says, mind the gap. Mind the gap. All right. Now, we've heard the word mind before. Like, you ever heard your mom and dad say, you better mind me? You ever had that? Okay. Those who mind the flesh. Now, you might think that means to mind the flesh as an, all right, I need to obey what the flesh says. No, it's not altogether what it's talking about. Though there are things about the flesh we have to to provide for it, right? Food, clothing, oxygen, right? Care for the body. If we get hurt, we need to go to the doctor, get sick, we need, you know, medicine to help care for that or whatever. Yes, there are things that we've got to consider and think about, but listen to me, to mind the gap. You know what that term means, to mind the gap? You ready? Everybody with me? Are you guys awake? Two of you. All right, I only see two of you shaking your head. Okay, three. All right, we're waking up here. Mind the gap just simply is this. In that country, there are times where there will be a crack in the sidewalk or whatever, and their concrete will get settled where one side will be down and the other one up a little bit, and they'll have signs that say, mind the gap. That means watch your step. Watch out. You could trip over the crack. Mind the gap. You walk over the gap so you don't trip. Does that make sense? So when the Scripture says that we that are living after the flesh, do mind the things of flesh. What it means is we're being mindful of what the flesh is looking for and what it needs. But those who mind the things of Spirit live after the Spirit. What that means is those who are living according to the Spirit are going to be watchful for the things that honor the Spirit, that feeds the Spirit, that gives strength to the Spirit. And so it says here in this passage, for those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. They mind the flesh. They mind the gap. But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds or they mind the gap on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is what? Is death. You know what it's saying there? If all you do is you constantly think about the cares and needs of the flesh and that's all you got your focus on, all you're doing is living a purposeless life. It's death. There's no purpose in that. If life equates to purpose, then death equates in no purpose. And so if I am mining the flesh and that's all I've got my mind set on and all I can think about is the next thing I'm going to eat, and the next place I'm going to go, and the next experience I can have, and the next relationship that I'm looking for. And if that's all my mind is set on, you're living a purposeless life. You're wasting life. 
you're living death when God wants you to live life. And it says, for to set your mind on the flesh is death, but to set your mind, look at it, on the spirit is what? Is what? Life and peace. Or as I titled the message, purpose and peace. So how do I do that, pastor? How, how do I live according to the spirit? All right, I don't want to mind the things of flesh. I want to mind the things of spirit. Hear me for a few moments. I'm just going to wrap it up with this thought. Let's look at Romans. And I know I didn't give you this verse, but I can have you turn there in your Bibles anyway to Romans chapter 7. It's the last two verses of chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. Romans chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. Look at those verses with me if you would. You ready? Romans chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. Wretched man that I am. First of all, there's a recognition by the Apostle Paul that he's a wretched man. I don't know about you, but I'm wretched. I don't like some of the things that pass through my mind, the thoughts that I have, the actions that I have, the way I treat people around me at times. I get so frustrated with myself. I wished I would have done things differently. Yesterday, I was driving down the road. We are going out to eat little old couple, man, they were in a car in front of me. We're on Burkhart Road. They got, they slowed down a whole lot. And then they started to turn like this. I thought, okay, they're turning. So I went around them a little bit. I don't know, I was pretty close to their car, but they were turning. I mean, they were turning. And I went by them, and I come back over only to realize, uh, they didn't turn. <laughs> I just kind of cut them off. That looked terrible. I was so angry with my son. I'm like, that you dummy, why didn't you just sit there and be patient and wait? Why? Maybe you don't have those moments, but I do. I get so frustrated with myself about those things. I want you to know that we deal with the flesh all the time. You do, I do. But our hope is found in Jesus' blood and righteousness. Our hope is found in Him and Him alone. It's not found in our ability to always get it right. Believe me, as long as you live in the flesh, you ain't always going to get it right. Matter of fact, you're going to feel like you get it wrong more than you get it right. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul even said, the things that I would do, I don't, and the things that I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. He felt the same way. Hear me out. It all goes back to something really important. Look with me if you would. O oh, wretched man that I am, the Apostle Paul wrote. Who? Not what. It doesn't say what will deliver me. It says who will deliver me. Don't miss that. It's powerful. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. I still have to feed the body. I still have to put clothes on this body. I still have to get up and go to work. I still have to take care of my kids. I still have to take care of my home. I still have to take care of my wife. I still have to be a good employee. I still have to, to do everything that God has given me the opportunity to do. I still have to do those things in the flesh. But my friend, I want to tell you something goes way beyond that listen to it even though we have to deal with those things it says I myself serve the law of God with my what with my say it with my what I serve the law of God with my with my mind with my mind with my mind with my mind listen to me mind the gap mind the gap consider watch contemplate know what it is that the Spirit of God wants mind that in your life how does God want you to treat other people 
When the law of the flesh raises up and wants to get angry or get mad, then you've got to remember the law of God is more important than the law of the flesh. We've got to trust God. You know how my actions change? It's not by becoming more religious. It's becoming more Christ-like and setting my thing, my mind on things above and not on things of the earth. Not setting my mind on running after all the pleasures of the world and everything I can consume with the flesh because at the end of the day, that's nothing but death. It's not life there. We don't find it in those things. Life is found in a relationship with Jesus. It's in Him that we find life and peace. It's in Him we find purpose and peace. So what is, what is it that God's called each and every one of us to do? He's called us to share Jesus with others in order that they can know the purpose and the peace of God. We had one of the nurses that helped take care of my dad in the service last week. And she said, I just wanted to drop by and see how y'all were doing. She said, there's just something sweet about that whole situation with your dad. And I just wanted to let you know that meant a lot. I want to tell you something. It's not through everything going right in our life and we get big houses and fancy cars and all that that's not where people see Jesus where people see Jesus in your life is when the hardships and the hard times come and Jesus sees you through those times that's when Jesus is encountered and it's in those moments that we realize there is the purpose and the peace of God that passes all understanding that guards our heart and minds and keeps it stayed on the Lord. We don't have that apart from our relationship with Jesus. We don't have it. Every head bowed and every eye closed.